pranams, and greetings to our spiritual family and friends everywhere. We hope you are enjoying this blessed week of Convocation as much as we are here at the Mother Center. Convocation brings a special joy to our ashrams as we participate in, in divine friendship with you. My name is Sister Karuna, and I'm happy to share with you in satsanga, inspiration, as well as practical guidance from the teachings of our guru, Paramahansa Yogananda. The word satsanga comes from the Sanskrit root, sat meaning truth, sangha meaning fellowship, or as our guru defined it, fellowship with truth. And most of you know that our guru came to the world to show us how to find freedom in God, how to commune with God, and to realize through practice of the balanced path of yoga, the divinity of the soul within each one of us. And Paramahansa has given us everything we could need to draw closer to God and to reach our highest spiritual goals through proven scientific meditation techniques as well as his how to live teachings. It's important in our sadhana, or spiritual discipline, to learn how to live in this world, how to get along with others, how to get along with ourselves. And yet to live harmoniously is, is something we all struggle with in this world. That is, the ego struggles with, not the soul. And how we live in this world ties into what our great Param Guru, Sri Yateshwarji, often said to his disciples, learn to behave. Doesn't that word behave make you cringe a little? Well, it does. No one likes to be told to behave. And yet, we know in our heart of hearts that we all have divine qualities within us that will help us to guide our behavior. So we will be spending a little more time on our first question because it is a subject that comes up regularly in our spiritual counseling. The question is, how can I respond gracefully when triggered in the moment, especially by a person? I don't want to project or blame, but I feel grumpy and don't want to take it out on anyone else. Well, first of all, I think we can all relate to this. We all have our own personal sensitivities or triggers, and when those sensitivities are triggered, it doesn't feel good. And for those of you who do not know what the word trigger means, it's basically an experience that causes a quick negative emotional reaction often based on some experience, unpleasant experience, earlier in life. And there are triggers that are very serious, and these come from deep traumas, and for these we would encourage professional help. Today in Satsanga, we'll speak to those general triggers that we all experience with our interactions with others from time to time. So the short answer to this question would be, when triggered, Engage the will. Pause. Deep breathe. Stay calm. And when you feel that the emotion has settled, then decide on your response. And hopefully it will be agreeable to the other person as well as yourself. Sounds simple, doesn't it? But it's not easy. We know that. In one of our Guru's anthologies, The Journey to Self-Realization, there's a marvelous chapter, The Art of Getting Along in This World. And this is wonderful. It not only gives you spiritual principles, but also practical advice on how to get along with others. We also have brief but potent thoughts from our Guru's teachings on this subject, from this wonderful book, Where There is Light. There is a whole chapter dedicated to this subject, and that chapter is entitled, Getting Along with Others. How we get along with others in this world is an important part of living on this earth plane. And we all, we all, no exceptions, even the saints occasionally run into people that are disagreeable or difficult to get along with. These are some of those thoughts from getting along with others from where there is light. Master said, If someone hurts you deeply, you remember it. 
But instead of concentrating on that, you should think of all the good things about that person who has hurt you and of all the goodness that you have in your life. Don't take notice of the insults people give you. Tall order, isn't it? Guruji also said, there's no more liberating action than sincerely to give people kindness in return for unkindness. And as we grow spiritually, we find that liberating action, giving kindness for unkindness, becomes more natural to us. Why? Because the more we meditate and we cultivate that inner environment, that inner calm, we don't want to disturb that from negative reactions. I especially like this quote by our guru. Even while striving to improve yourself, learn to stand alone, secure in your own virtues and self-worth. Remember, it isn't only your words that have an effect, but what you are and what you feel within, what is in your soul. Always strive to be an angel within, no matter how others behave. Be sincere, kind, loving, and understanding. And if these virtuous qualities will take some time to practice and to adopt in your life, well, there's another option. Adopt a pet. Not too long ago, I happened upon a story about a smart African parrot named Sadie. And this is an excerpt from that story that included an interview with Jim, the proud owner of Sadie. Jim suffers from a mood disorder and anger management. But thanks to his service pet, Sadie, Jim no longer has outbursts that would get him or others into trouble. Before his anger has a chance to escalate, Sadie takes action, telling him, it's okay, Jim. Calm down, Jim. You're all right, Jim. I'm here, Jim. Sadie learned to say these things when she heard Jim say them to himself during one of his episodes. And since Sadie has come into his life, he's had one outburst, and that was when he forgot Sadie at home. So Sadie is often seen with Jim out and about, close at hand, in a special backpack. An interesting fact about Sadie is that she used to just parrot but as she got to know Jim, she could feel when her, his mood was about to change. And she would immediately begin to calm him down before the unwanted emotion emerged. And so we all have our own inner Sadies, better known as our voice of conscience. And the more we listen to that inner guidance within, the clearer and the, the louder it becomes, the less we listen to that inner guiding voice, the quieter it becomes. Our conscience, the voice of our soul within, will help us to react calmly when provoked. And the sooner we can calm the emotion triggered by another person, the better able we will calm the reaction or control the reaction. Master said, always listen to your conscience, the voice of your inner self. It is there to help you get along with yourself. And there's a great truth in that statement. Get along with yourself. Trust yourself. If we can get, uh, get along with ourself and trust that inner voice within, and as, as Guruji said, be secure in your own virtues and self-worth, we will get along with others in our lives. As the German poet, philosopher, and writer Goethe once said, as soon as you trust yourself, you will know how to live. This is what our beloved Diamata said on this subject. Even if a situation triggers inner resistance or anxiety, realize that no matter what is taking place outwardly, you can choose to live with God in your heart, to think peace-giving thoughts, and to act in accord with your conscience. So our conscience is a wonderful 
wonderful tool to help us get along in this world. It's admirable that this person who wrote this question wants to respond gracefully in these situations. So what are some of those graceful qualities we can express? Kindness, patience, self-control, and forgiveness. And sometimes silence is the best way to respond. Not a negative silence, but a silence that says, I care, but I'm not quite ready to respond. And these graceful soul qualities are like hidden diamonds found through meditation and God contact. As our guru said, just as gems are hidden in a mine, so the jewel presence of God is hidden under the soil of our hard indifference. We have to dig through that soil again and again with the pickaxe of meditation. So along with cultivating our own soul qualities, if we can see the other person that is triggering us as a soul and send silent thoughts of peace, and harmony. These thoughts can even be more powerful than words. There was a time I was having a communication problem with someone else. And it got to the point where we, we weren't communicating at all. And this was awkward because we had to work together in the same area. And it became uncomfortable, so I sought out the counsel of one of our senior nuns. And what she said to me has stayed with me for many years. She said, it's not quite time for you to sit down and try to talk to the other person. But what you can do is talk with her soul, with love. Talk with her soul. And so I tried that. In my meditations, I took a couple minutes out for probably the, next, the, the following few days, and it was quite remarkable. It wasn't long before we were sitting down, talking t- together. We worked out our differences, and she has been a dear friend ever since. Our guru said, it's easy to strike back, but to give love is the highest way to disarm your persecutor. Even if it doesn't work at the time, he will never be able to forget that when he gave you a slap, you gave love in return. That love must be sincere. When it comes from the heart, love is magical. You should not look for the effects. Even if your love is spurned, pay no attention. Give love and forget. Don't expect anything. Then you will see the magical result. I remember one such magical moment many years ago when I happened upon a interaction between two very different personalities. And this is when I walked into a, a room where we keep our photocopy machine. And a friend of mine was standing in front of the machine and she was trying to figure it out. It was a new machine. So I was just about to go in and help her, try to help her figure it out, when someone else burst into the room, immediately assumed that my friend was misusing the new machine and began to criticize her harshly. Well, I I backed out of the way, and I I wasn't sure how it was going to go. So... After the confrontational person showed my friend, step by over-exaggerated step, how to use the new machine, she said to my friend, okay, do you have any questions? All that unperturbed, gentle soul said was, thank you. The other person was immediately disarmed. You could see her whole body relaxed, and she even spared a little smile as she walked out of the room. And as, after she walked out of the room, my friend turned to me, and with a twinkle in her eye, she said, You see, I always have the last word. It was obvious to me that she didn't take herself, the situation, the other person too seriously. And she did not react defensively. Instead, she was even-minded, and she was able to retain her inner calm. Swami Shankara, one of India's great sages who taught even-mindedness, said this, Be of even mind, 
if you want the even-minded Lord to adorn the altar of your soul. And Guruji said, happiness lies in a constant state of unruffled peace during all the experiences of earthly dualities. So even-mindedness is a very important quality to express or to experience while you're going through a difficult interaction with anybody. And finally, a very effective way to avoid an emotional reaction that occurs when you've been triggered in the moment is by using affirmations. Affirmations, when practiced regularly and with deep concentration, can change your thoughts. As Guruji said, change your thoughts if you wish to change your circumstances. And this affirmation that I found in Where There Is Light is, is one we can use anywhere. And it's, it's simple, but very effective. Now let us close our eyes and repeat after me. I will make up my mind to be happy within myself, right now, where I am today. I will make up my mind to be happy within myself, right now, where I am today. I will make up my mind to be happy within myself, right now, where I am today. I will make up my mind to be happy within myself, right now, where I am today. And repeat this affirmation as much as you can throughout the day. So our next question, is the world really going down or is the media just promoting negativity? Other than turning off devices, any other suggestions for devotees to add value in saving this planet? Believe it or not, this world is not going down, but it's actually moving upward. And the Holy Science by Swami Sri Yukteswar, there's a wonderful explanation of the repeating cycles of evolution and devolution that the world goes through. And these different phases are cycles that are called yugas. Right now we're in an ascending age. We left the dark age of Kali Yuga, the age of materialism, and we have entered Dwapara Yuga, the atomic age or the electrical age. Paramahansaji pointed out that while Dwapara Yuga presents the opportunity for much good, there's also potential for harm through the misuse of technology that is so prevalent during this atomic age. We've already seen great advances in technology through the sciences and medicine and the industries. Unfortunately, we've also seen the misuse of technology as well. For example, the negative impacts that have become apparent through the misuse of digital media and other means. Our guru said, in keeping with the influence of Dwapara Yuga, technology is rapidly moving the general populace to higher levels of achievement. But this progress also creates a greater gap between the achievers and the non-achievers. This foments jealousies and social, economic, and political troubles. Isn't that true even today? In speaking about our devices, they can certainly help us navigate through this modern age. But it's important that we, we choose how much of that, the negative media we allow into our consciousness. Not too long ago, I was speaking to a woman, and she was, she was concerned about the state of the world today, and she was complaining about the disparity and the lack of unity. But she was a minister, and a minister in her own right. She gave me a lecture on positive thinking and prayer. 
But all the while she was talking to me, she was, she was looking at her notifications on her phone. Sometimes she'd smile, sometimes she'd frown, and at one point she even cursed her phone. And then she went nonchalantly back into the conversation about positive thinking and prayer. So our devices are a great help to us when they do not control us. Dhyamataji said, thought is a force. It has immense power. That is why I believe so deeply in the worldwide prayer circle. When people send forth concentrated positive thoughts of peace, love, goodwill, forgiveness, this generates a great power. United prayer has great power. During this period of pandemic, the monastics at all of our ashrams have been practicing the healing service three times a day rather than our normal twice a day. And we know that many of you there in our centers and groups and your homes meditating with us also practice Master's healing service. Speaking of the power of prayer, a young girl once came to me for counseling, and this was, this was during one convocation. I was serving in the counseling area. And she was very young, and I hadn't counseled anyone that young. And I was curious as to what she had to say. She had a question about one of the meditation techniques. And after we talked about the technique and covered her questions, we just chatted. And this is when she really opened up. I asked her how she was, generally speaking. And this is what she said. She said, I used to be very unhappy and scared, especially because of all the school shootings that were taking a, pl a place across the country. And I asked her, not afraid now? She said, no, because I surround myself in prayer. I was fascinated. And I asked her, may I know what that prayer is? And she said simply, Om, I, pra I practice Om. I concentrate here at the Christ Center, as Guruji tells us to do, and I chant Om as much as I can during the day. And she said, when I do that, I feel safe. On the subject of keeping our consciousness in the higher centers, and especially at the point between the eyebrows, I came across a wonderful quotation in our, our new lessons. And it's, it's, it's actually a technique that we can use. Master said, always keep your mind concentrated between the eyebrows. That technique is the door through which cosmic consciousness comes. Keep on looking in between the eyebrows and keep on inviting cosmic consciousness and peace through that door. And you will find yourself mentally powerful, always able to do what you should do and what you really want to do. If humankind practiced that wonderful technique with the faith of a child, what a better world we would live in. In addition to power of the power of prayer for this world and turning off our devices periodically, Master taught to counteract ne negativity in this world, we should start with ourselves. And as we strive to act rightly according to Dharma and to cultivate a greater harmony and understanding with others, and above all, to establish a deep and loving relationship with God through our daily experiences and through meditation, we will be adding a wonderful force for good in this world. As Krishna said to his disciple Arjuna, be anchored in that which is changeless. That is, be anchored in God. So how do we become anchored in God? Again, by following the balanced path of yoga as taught in the Gita. And by striving to hold on to the after effects of meditation. And by practicing the presence of God throughout the day. Then we won't be so affected by duality because we will, as our guru often quoted, be in this world, but not of it. There's another affirmation, which is more like a prayer. 
that you might want to try while you're engaged in your daily activities. And this is one that Guruji often prayed. And simply, God, Christ, Gurus. Mentally repeat this divine prayer over and over again with deep attention. What we think about most, we draw into our life. Why not draw the highest? God, Christ, Gurus. Our next question. My mother never loved me, so it is hard for me to feel love for Divine Mother or her love. Maybe other devotees have had the same problem. How would you guide us? Can I leave Divine Mother out of the prayer invocation? Well, it is true that there are souls that are not blessed with a loving mother in their lives. And for various reasons, karmically, or because of some disharmony in early family life, Some people cannot relate to Divine Mother or even Heavenly Father. But love comes to us in many forms, and everyone can and will respond to a loving relationship in this world. When we think about it, it's really love that the human heart, the soul, is seeking. That is our birthright. It's our destiny. Our Creator is very understanding and knows each one of us intimately and will try by any means for us to experience His love through another person or others. I remember an experience I had many years ago. This was before I entered the ashram. I was working as a nurse and I was caring for a little boy. He couldn't have been more than one years old. He was very ill and he was very sad. And for some reason, his family was not visiting him. And I could see that he was deteriorating day by day. And one day, as I was caring for him, he lifted his hand to take mine. And as a nurse, you're trained not to get emotionally involved with your patients. But I thought, this child, all he really needs is a hug. So I picked him up, I hugged him, and he held on as if I was his very breath. I could have been anyone. What this child really needed was a caring heart, a loving heart. And the child, I did this for a few days after after that, and he recovered fully. What What was so gratifying was to see the smile on his face. So for those souls who have not had the love of a mother. There is love in other forms that the divine will manifest through. Dhyamachaji encouraged devotees to personalize that love in a way that is most attractive to them. And Guruji said that in whatever way you invoke God, He does respond. And in your private devotions, Concentrate on that aspect, that quality or incarnation of God that is most meaningful to you. Listen to your heart. When we reach our final goal, that is union with God, the Lord will reveal all the mysteries of our difficult relationships and we will understand. Ultimately, it is the true Guru, the Sat Guru, that can give us unconditional love. And that, that guru will show us, lead us to freedom from all sorrows. Our guru once said to a beloved disciple, Seen or unseen, I shall ever hover around you, guarding you with all my life in God unto the end. Keep your faith ever and ever increasing, for God through me is guiding you. Even the best of mothers, fathers, and spouses cannot say that. Our Guru tells us that the Hindu scriptures teach that God is both imminent and transcendent, personal and impersonal. And he may, he may be sought as the absolute or as one of his manifest eternal qualities, The mother aspect of God that is active in creation may be referred 
to in various forms such as Shakti or power or other aspects of divinity such as Om, Holy Ghost, cosmic intelligent vibration, or nature, Prakriti, or the personal aspect of God that embodies love, forgiveness, and compassion. These are qualities normally associated with the mother. When I think of love, compassion, forgiveness, I think of the Lord Jesus Christ and Bhagavan Krishna. So the aspect of God as the cosmic mother is omnipresent, everywhere sustaining and nurturing cre creation and loving all souls unconditionally, whether or not we love her. So we would not suggest that you leave Divine Mother out of your prayer invocations. You may not feel a connection with her, but Divine Mother feels a connection with you, and she will want to be a part of your prayers and your meditations. Our next question is similar in a delightful way. Devotionally speaking, I have always been inclined toward Sri Yukteswar rather than Paramahansa Yogananda. I know these great ones are not jealous, but I still feel bad as if I'm neglecting Master. Do you have any thoughts on this subject? This is a question that comes up from time to time for those who have committed to our path of Self-Realization Fellowship and our lineage of gurus. Paramahansaji is our Sat Guru, and he is leading us to our liberation, even if it takes lifetimes. But in addition, we have five other gurus who are blessing our lives, guiding our lives, and sometimes the devotees feel a stronger attraction toward one of our gurus, and that's perfectly fine. I suspect that our guru, who very much loved his guru, Swami Sri Yukteswar, would be thrilled to know that you would revere Swami Sri Yukteswarji. And you're right that the gurus are not jealous of each other. In fact, they are all one. They are divine avatars, all reflections of the infinite Lord. And in loving one of them, you're essentially loving them all. So it's understandable as disciples to be drawn to one of the, one of the gurus, depending on what their quality is or what their personality is and what our own needs are. One of my brothers, who actually introduced me to the teachings, has, has always been very drawn to Swami Sri Yukteswarji. And he has an altar, and on his altar he has the gurus, and he has a large picture of Swami Sri Yukteswarji. And I'd always been curious as to why he was drawn to, to Swami Sri Yukteswar. So I asked him recently, and he said, I'm drawn to his nature of wisdom. And Sri Yukteswarji is often referred to as Gyanavatar. Master himself said he did not want our adoration, and any love that we offer him, he offers to the Divine. And it's the same with Swami Sri Yukteswarji. He will offer any reverence that we give to him to the Divine. Sri Dayamata told a story of an experience she had with Swam Swami Sri Yukteswarji. This is what she wrote. Guruji often praised the work of Anandamata, my sister who came to the ashram a couple years after I did. She is a perfectionist, he said, always thorough and carrying out her duties. One day, when we had been there just a short time, he looked at both of us and said of Anandama, how my guru would have appreciated her services. Throughout the years, he would repeat this, saying how much Anandama's meticulous ways would have pleased Swami Sri Yukteswarji. In my early years, my feelings were quite sensitive about this, because he never said anything about Sri Yukteswar appreciating me. So one day I said to him, Master, isn't there anything about me that your guru would have liked? He laughed and said lightheartedly, If you had been in my guru's ashram, he would have chastised you just as he did me. 
Later in my room, I thought about this. Well, it's nice that Guruji says I am like him, I told myself. But still, I'm not totally satisfied. Surely Sri Yateshwarji would find something worthwhile in me. And here you can just see the human and the divine coming into play. I sat down in front of my little altar with the pictures of the gurus on it and meditated. Sri Yateshwarji and I had a mental discussion. I guess you could say that I had it out with him. You can do this when you have a loving, trusting relationship. I told him what I was feeling and what I wanted to know was if he had any love for me. As I continued to meditate and pour out my heart to him, suddenly I felt such bliss, such blessing coming from Sri Yateshwarji's altar photo. From that moment on, my consciousness toward him forever changed. I felt his great love. And I told myself, I now know beyond all doubt that Sri Yateshwarji loves me. Divine assurance is indisputable when it comes through meditation. So yes, it's perfectly fine to be drawn to Sri Yateshwarji or any of the other gurus in our lineage. Our next and last two questions are similar, so we'll cover them together. And they are, I want to have long meditations as Master advises, but it's hard for me to sit long without moving due to some physical problems. Please advise. And the second question, as I get into my senior years, I find there are issues with the body that impact my meditations, such as stiffness, soreness, and chronic pain. Yoga teaches mastery of the body, and yet with old age, it seems that the body becomes ever more demanding and controlling. How can we overcome this? How can a devotee in later years of life continue to seek God vigorously? Well, first of all, it's not necessary during your long meditations to force yourself to sit still the entire time. It's all right to adjust the body. It's all right to adjust your posture if it will make you feel more comfortable, especially if you're having physical difficulties. We need to use common sense in adjusting the body. We can use cushions. You can use uh, a supportive chair. But don't forsake your meditation because of pain. Do whatever you can to make yourself comfortable. And if you're if your physical problems are serious, it would be all right to lean back in the chair or to recline for a time. But we would advise you not to move around too frequently. So the exception to leaning back in, in your chair would be that during your practice of Kriya, you need to have a straight spine. That's essential. You won't lean, you won't lean back against the chair. I once had a conversation with a dear elderly devotee who had chronic back pain, but she also had regular long meditations. And I once asked her how she managed to have those meditations when I knew that she was in pain. And she said she gained so much from reading the lives of, of the saints, and especially the life of, of Sister Gyanamata. Sister Gyanamata was a foremost disciple of our guru. And this, this devotee would read from God alone. This is a book about Sister. And this is one of those thoughts from Sister Ganamata. If we never had anything painful or alarming to face, if it were just joy in God all the time, what would we be? Spiritual cream puffs. Well, my friend is anything but a spiritual cream puff, but I still wasn't satisfied. What does she do when she's really in pain? I couldn't accept the fact that she would just sit there and will force herself to keep going. So she said, this is what I do. When my back hurts, I get up and I walk around my altar slowly while I offer my oblations. 
She said, and then when the pain subsides, then I will sit again in my meditation. She said, this doesn't interrupt my meditation. And she said, I feel that the, the gurus actually like this. There was something special in what she did when she was feeling discomfort in her meditations. She was offering her devotion. And in that sense, she was, she was not interrupting her meditation at all. Dayamataji once said, the easiest way to find God is through devotion. So for those of you who cannot sit long in meditation due to physical pain, you may be encouraged by, by what Master said regarding an elderly person who came to the path later in life. And this was a story told by Brother Anandamoy in one of his talks. And this is an excerpt of what Brother Anandamoy said. It was during Guruji's lifetime when a woman came on the path. She was 80 years old, and she had not lived a particularly spiritual life. She was a good woman. Brother Anandamoy was actually wondering how this woman would be able to take on the spiritual discipline at her age. And Master replied to his question, She will reach the goal in this life because of her great sincerity. Our Guru said, Sincerity is a virtue of virtues in the realm of spirituality. A heart that is pure in its intention is the way to touch the heart of God. And our beloved Dayamata said, Sincerity is the very foundation of the soul's relationship with God. It means to be able to go to God and talk to Him openly and intimately in the simplest language of your heart. Help me, Lord. Before I entered the ashram, I was working at a Catholic convent, and one of the nuns I was caring for was very crippled with arthritis. She couldn't do anything for herself. She was confined to a wheelchair. One day, after getting to know her a little bit better, I asked her how she could be so patient when I knew that she was in so much pain. And this is what she said. Through this difficult test, I am closer to Jesus in a deeper way, more than when I was able to use my hands to serve God. She said that her physical difficulties made her completely dependent on God in every way. It tested every virtue she was striving to attain. What a beautiful attitude. As Master said to Sister Gyanamata when she struggled with painful physical problems, all of your spiritual acquisitions are being put to the test by physical illness. And some of you may remember what our Guru said at Sister's memorial when he said, in all those years she suffered, she showed that her love for God was greater, and I never saw one mark of suffering in her eyes. That is why she is a great saint, a great soul, and that is why she is with God. To conclude our satsanga, let us remember that we all have our unique journeys back to God. And yet we have a fully liberated divine guru who has given us everything we need to hasten our way home. The sublime Kriya Yoga meditation techniques that include the Hongsa technique and the Om technique. These techniques are so essential in helping us on the spiritual path and deepening our relationship with God. And again, sincerity is essential in deepening our relationship with God. We don't have to be perfect to approach God. Guruji said, Sincerity is the transparent diamond through which the light of God shines in our lives. And that light of God is the perfect soul within each one of us. In closing our satsanga, I'd like to read a portion of a beautiful affirmation by our Guru. 
If you wish, you may close your eyes and repeat after me. I am the blessed child of sweet immortality, sent here to play the drama of births and deaths, but always remembering my deathless self. I am the blessed child of sweet immortality, sent here to play the drama of births and deaths, but always remembering my deathless self. I am the blessed child of sweet immortality, sent here to play the drama of births and deaths, but always remembering my deathless self. Jai Guru, Jai Ma.